going to bring him out in just a second here. Uh, but before that, just some brief instructions. Yes, we will be taking fan questions from all of you. The microphone is right here to my left uh, in the second row here at the end. I will let you know after a little bit of time uh, when it's to be a good time to start lining up. But we will be taking questions from you. That's that. Uh, what do you say we uh, introduce the man we're all here to see? Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Carl! Take the jacket I'm, off here. I'm doing the script for you all. Okay. There you go. Need some music here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've done it. Done it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. How are you doing today? Hi. Thank you all for coming. This is very cool. This is very, very cool. <laughs> Well, uh, Carl, thank you for being here. Um, have you been to Portland before? Jeremy, come on. I know, right? Come on. <laughs> the first time I drove through the area, I'm going to really date myself now, was 1971 72. Okay. And I drove from Oakland to Vancouver, British Columbia. And I did it all in one straight drive, like a fool, because I was really young. I gotta tell you, that was a long yeah, drive. how long was that? But it was so gorgeous that I eventually, I, I remember saying then, as a young guy, and of course, it was so beautiful, and it was just this corridor of trees as you went I-5 all the way, you know, to Canada, and I remember saying then, man, someday I want to live in that area. And long, long, short story is I eventually moved and lived on Whidbey Island for 10 years. Really? Yeah. So Portland, I've been to many times. I raised cattle, purebred limousine. I was breeding cattle. And of course, Oregon, as we all know, there's a lot of cattle in Oregon, a lot of farmers in Oregon. And you go on the east of the highway there, headed over going east, and a lot of people with cattle, and I met them, and bought cattle and sold cattle and showed cattle throughout Oregon, so it's happy to be back where my cattle, some of them at least, the bloodline exists. Uh, Still some Carl what, what, what a ridiculous story, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, see, I've never been to Portland. This is my first time here. Get so, out of here, you yeah, serious? No, never been here before. What the heck are you doing, man? This is a beautiful area. This is, I gotta tell you Jeez. guys, I'm loving this area. I, I need to get out of here more. I'll buy some cattle, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I even, you know, I even, uh, anybody here remember the Sasquatch Dumpling Gang? Anybody? Anybody? Ah, here? oh, one person here raised that. That was shot in this area. We shot that here in Portland. Okay. You know? uh, one of my fun, fun experiences, even though the movie didn't do particularly <laughs> well, but it was a great, great group of people involved. With it. In fact, Justin Long was in that movie. Really? Yeah, it was one of the early roles that he did. And, uh, I played uh, Professor Artemis Snodgrass. Well, that's a name. Who, that wasn't it though? Great yeah. moniker, Artemis. And Artemis was a man who was an expert on Bigfoot. Nice. <laughs> so needless to say, I was hunting Bigfoot. All right. And so, some of you probably seen Bigfoot, read Bigfoot <laughs> in the literary portal. Do you believe in Bigfoot? I've been called Bigfoot. Ah, there it is. <laughs> yes, Bigfoot does exist. <laughs> Bigfoot may not be exactly what we all imagined, but come on, man. He's there. You know, uh, there is something that's happened over the millennia, and uh, species have, you know, evolved. And so why not? Bigfoot's still out there roaming, roaming the woods, you know? So be careful. Yes. Be careful. Look behind you tonight when you go out. <laughs> to feed the dog or walk the dog. If you hear anything go crunch, Run. turn around, yeah. Bigfoot. <laughs> Just Bigfoot. assume it's Bigfoot. <laughs> oh, I know you're all so scared now, aren't you? Yeah, I know, we're terrified. They're everywhere in Portland. That's it, yeah. <laughs> um, well, tell me a little bit something. You took kind of, you know, I always want to know people's superhero origin stories is what I call them, you know, like, um, but I know that you didn't like just go straight into acting, right? So like, how did you go from, you know, Carl Weathers, born human, into, uh, you know, movie star Carl Weathers? I, I was born acting like a human. There you go. <laughs> there it was. <laughs> you know, as most 
helped humans begin, right? Uh, no, I, I, you know, as a kid in grade school, uh, and I think some, some of us can relate to this, um, there's this thing where the first time someone uh, shows appreciation for you as a, as a human being, as a person, as a little one, right? It can be in the form of applause, where they basically are saying, oh, we like what you did. That is so infectious. That's a disease, yeah. man. And I did the first play I did when I was in grade school, and hallelujah, <laughs> I found the promised land. Because when they applauded, and when they laughed at certain lines, and you're a little kid up there performing, it's like so heady, you know, it's a great experience. And so I pursued that for a little bit through grade school and then into to junior high, which is now called secondary, secondary I think, right? Yeah. yeah. So that shows you how old I am. <laughs> and, uh, and then I realized something. I realized that girls actually didn't care about guys and tights doing Shakespeare, <laughs> but they did care about athletes. Ah. And since I was somewhat athletic, football. Ah, so yeah. that was the circuitous journey, you know. Here we are today, I'm back in tights doing Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, you know, when I think of you, there's so many iconic things that come to mind. Um, you know, you played a lot of different characters that I'm sure many of these people think of in the room, but what I would like to know is, you know, when you played that many, which one, do you think that one of them, like, is, is more, like, akin to you, like, or that you've taken on that, like, feels more like you over the years? Sure, I mean, that's a ridiculous question. <laughs> And the reason it's so ridiculous is I have multiple personality disorder. Ah, I'm all of well, those people. He's all of them. I'm okay. all of them. Okay, at one time or another in my life, <laughs> I have been as silly as Chubbs Peterson. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have an hour to bite my hand off. There we go. Yeah, okay. I have been as uh, much, uh, I guess, a showman who. Uh, wants to be center stage as Apollo Creed, right? I have been as uh, out there in the outer space as Grief Card. <laughs> you know, I've had all these personalities and, you know, I've been Action Jackson, I like running and catching cabs, of course. You yes, know. yes. Uh, all of those wild characters, uh, I think, you know, for actors there's a, it's being back to that thing when I, when I was talking about being a kid. Mm -hmm. Having people applaud and, and basically endorse what you do and get entertained by you. There's nothing like inhabiting these characters and trying to do your best to convince people that that's real. Yeah. You know, that's, that's all the job really is, is pretending. And I guarantee you, every one of us out here can remember back to when we were a kid, pretending. You know, whether it was, I remember my sister, uh, bless her, uh, with the easy bake oven, <laughs> pretending to cook, right? <laughs> and then they want to feed you some of that mud in a Ooh, pan, okay? No. And, and uh, you know, as a kid myself, pretending with every guy in here who had maybe little toy soldiers, or had little cars racing them, you know, or had a when I was a kid, it really takes you back there, I had a train, a Lionel train. Yeah, yeah. And guess what? You know what I'm talking about? It had a little circle that was only about three feet, <laughs> right? And you just sit there watching it around and around and around all day long. It didn't go anywhere. It's like but, last time, right? <laughs> but you're pretending, man. You're having a great time, you know? You're the conductor and you're the passenger and you're everything that can be. And then every once in a while you want to put something up so it can crash. Yeah, and you yeah. see the crash. That's being a guy, you know? You can see the action crash. to that, yeah. Hey. You know, so yeah, all those characters. Well, you did mention, of course, uh, Grief Karga there. Um, anybody yes. in here seen The Mandalorian? Uh, anybody at all? Uh, anybody seen that show? Oh. Well, tell me all about it. Somebody, yeah, what yeah, is somebody. that about? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. I, I know there's a, I know there's a guy in there in this crazy helmet who can't take it off because the creed is creed. Did I mention creed? Oh. Notice how I slipped that one in there. Huh? Because the creed is you can't take it off. If you do, then you're no longer a Matt Mandalorian. What's that all about? Yeah. That's like saying, uh, let's see, I'm a holy roller. 
right? And because I don't wear the right shoes to stomp in, I can't be a holy roller anymore. Come on, man. <laughs> Just because you take the helmet off. It's, you know, being a Mandalorian is in the heart. You know, well, it's, it's a helmet. You need to get some sunlight on that face. Ah, I'd say so, you know. <laughs> guy's walking around looking pretty, pretty pale with that. And plus, can you imagine wearing a helmet all day long, every day, all day? It'd be so sweaty inside, that thing would stink after a while. Let's get real. But the Mandalorian, you know, somehow he's got a shower inside his helmet. Yeah, yeah. Know. Hair always perfectly clogged. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I do love that uh, you're not only on, on camera with that, but you've also got the chance to direct some of those episodes. Yes. 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 Um, yes. Oh, yeah. Like, and of course, you've directed other things as well, but like, specifically when it comes to that show, like, how is it like when you know that you're on screen, on screen, but also behind the camera as well. Fun fact, everyone in here is the star of their story, and everyone in here is directing the story. So how easy is it to live your life when you're the director, okay? How is it for, you know, Grief Karga to be as cool as there ever can be a Grief Karga when he, Grief Karga's directing it? It's a great job. I love it, man. You know? it's, um, it's wonderful, first of all, to be involved in a project that is so well-conceived, written so well, uh, we have the benefit of all of the Star Wars lore. We have the benefit of Dave Filoni, who I guess you could say was spoon-fed by George Lucas. For real? At the right hand of, who knows the lore as well as anyone on planet, probably besides George. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And then we have, my God, man, one of the best filmmakers in the world, John Favreau, Favreau who basically yeah. created this whole thing with the blessings of George et al. And who is so involved in every bit of it, from the writing of it to actually what you finally see on screen. So with all those and this wonderful cast that they have put together, uh, Emily Swallow, Katie Sankoff, of course, uh, I mean, the Mandalorian himself, right? Uh, Grogu, I mean, come on. That guy, yeah. How can you not love this show uh, when there's so much attention put on it and uh, people's craft is so well executed at the end of the day? And then, of course, because of all the fantastic special effects people who really masterfully craft and create this show and, and the, I guess you could say, the, the multiverse that you see on the screen. Yeah. Uh, it's one of, one of the highlights of, of yours truly's career because there's nothing like being involved with something that's good. <laughs> you know, that's really good. So I love it. Yeah, was there, like, obviously this was the first live action Star Wars television series um, that ever existed. Um, and obviously the fan reaction has been so amazing because, as you said, it's expertly written. But at the time when you're making that first season, are you feeling some pressure, like, to get this thing right? You know, wow, good question, Jeremy. But I, I, I hate saying this because it sounds maybe a little jaded, but it's true. I haven't felt pressure in my career in probably, uh, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven years. There comes a point where if you know how to do what you do, then you're not worried about doing it anymore. All you care about is doing it as well as you can. So the pressure is, only there if you start creating, I think, impediments for yourself, you know? And that's probably for everybody from an ingenue, a novice actor, to somebody who's been around for, well, I was gonna say 50 years. I've been professional for 50 years, 80 years, okay? Doing it professionally. Because it's like, it's like walking, you know? Unless you have some issue, you're not gonna forget how to walk one day. I mean, you know, it just doesn't, that's not the way life works. And as an actor, at a certain point, you know what you're doing. It's now, can you immerse yourself and be creative? Because the craft is the craft. And if you've gotten to a place, and I'd like to use the word master, you can master the craft. 
you could be anything from a cartoonist to an aviator, an aviatrix. It ain't gonna get any better if you're at the top of the game. Now it becomes how can you do it with less effort and make it look effortless? How can you do it in such a way that it looks like you were born that way to do that thing, you know? Yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Of course it did. <laughs> um, there's a, so I saw that you did confirm you are directing again in season three. Yep. Yes. Yep. Good. Good. Yes. Good. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and it's going to be one of the best episodes ever in anything ever. that's ever been shown in front of an audience. Yes. I guarantee you. Yes. <laughs> Well, and I, I told you backstage, I'm not going to ask you for spoilers or anything like that. Go ahead, but ask me. Can you ask give us all the spoilers, please? Yes. <laughs> it's going to be airing starting March 1st. Oh, the ultimate spoiler. Don't tell anybody I said it, though, okay? It's on Disney Plus. But don't tell anybody I said it, okay? You're getting the exclusives right Pedro now. Pascal will be in this crazy getup, but don't tell anybody I said it, okay? <laughs> Or if I say any more, they're gonna come and get me and yeah. lock me up. So I better Star be Wars people look back. I know they're time. watching. They're watching. There are plants out here in the audience. <laughs> I can tell you. We got dark guns out yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, obviously you can't tell us too much, but like, what if if I ask you this one? Where, like, what can you tell us about where Grief Cargo is at the season? I can tell you this: Grief Cargo is sitting in this seat right here. <laughs> okay, uh, he is. Sartori Sartorioli, say that fast, in splendor this season. His, his magnificent uh, wardrobe, his gowns, the way he moves, um, the cape behind him, this crazy beautiful color of, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, what is it? It's not red really, it's, it's something deeper. It's kind of the color of that lady's. You know, skirt there, it's yeah. just this beautiful, deep, deep, reddish, rosy color. And uh, he and Grogu and, and, and Mando are sort of reconnecting. And, okay. and, and you know, grief is, grief is doing the damn thing, as they say. He's, <laughs> he's got Navarro coming up, you know? It's like, they're moving on up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, from the east side. <laughs> so, uh, I just think it's going to be an exciting and big. Yeah. You know, the scope this season is pretty amazing. Uh, the directors all, I, I would, every time I had a chance, go and, you know, try to steal from other directors because I could see what they're doing. And I'm thinking, oh boy, that's going to really look good. Now, what can I do that's going to one up that? You know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, everybody really kind of threw down. And I think, again, John Favreau did. As usual, I mean, the guy just delivers. Yeah. So you can't imagine that post-production is not going to be so magnificent. And the score, the score on that series, on our, I will take some of the credit for it, yeah. on our series, I think is one of the best scores on anything in television or movies. Uh, Gorn just does an amazing job, you know? So it's, I'm, I'm just hoping that people really enjoy it as much if not more than they did season two and of course season one when it was like brand new. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's why yeah, Katie Sackhoff was here just a little bit ago and said that the action and the scale of this series, uh, this season is going to be quite impressive. Well, Katie ought to know, she's in throughout the thing, you know, oh, so yeah. come on, she's, a, she's an addition that I don't know if, uh, I don't know if season three would be as good as I think it's going to be without Katie. Oh yeah, I mean, she brings it, man. She really does. You know? There you go. And she's fun to be around too. She's a lovely, lovely human being. Yes, she had very nice things to say about you as well. Oh, she's lying. <laughs> she's lying. She's lying. I, I do nothing nice. I try to be an irritant with everyone I encounter. Well, that's a good way to go. I that's it. They remember you that way, you know. Yeah, that guy's a pain in the butt, but you know. As an actor, um, and that probably as any kind of creative person, no matter what it is you do, you could be a seamstress, you could be a designer, an architect, you could be uh, a shoemaker, uh, you could be a stylist and do people's hair or makeup or whatever. You bring to the table 
to the job what you've learned over all that time prior to you doing that particular job. And you bring your own personal experience in it because you evolve not only as a human being but as an artist. It's just the way we all are, whether we recognize it or not. Excuse me. So that evolution includes an education, right? You become more educated in the craft. It also includes your own personal experiences, biases, and otherwise. So when you bring all that to the table as an actor, you can utilize it. Doing one film, the first Rocky, which we were shooting in 76, all the way until the last film, we're now in the 80s. A lot of water went under the bridge. <laughs> we were able to, I was able to, and I think every actor would be able to utilize that because you start to see how you have either grown or, <laughs> in some cases, not grown. You may be, you know, uh, and how can you utilize that in a way that reflects whatever truth you know in life, and is still entertaining. So it was one of the best opportunities that you could ever have in something where there was time between to also reflect on what you'd experienced and bring that to the table and utilize that, you know? Um, so it, it was a very, those movies were really fertile ground for development as an actor, as an artist, as a filmmaker. And uh, man, I couldn't, I couldn't have been more blessed to have been a part of it as a result. Absolutely. Yeah. So man, I assume it's a great point of pride that the series is continuing with, you know, Michael B. Jordan, the way those films have gone. <laughs> to me, as long as people who the films are made for are enjoying them, that's all, that's all it really is about. Because if you're making films for yourself to sit in your home with your your, your, your iPhone at this point, I was going to say Super 8 camera, that's what you want. But with your iPhone or whatever, just for you, that's one thing. But if you're making this for mass consumption, yeah, you want to tell your story and put your imprimatur on it, but if nobody else gets it, you're wasting a lot of money and a lot of time. And so certainly in the commercial filmmaking business, the idea is to entertain and give people a story that they can relate to. Absolutely. Well, all right, well, we're going to go to um, our audience here and yes. uh, get some questions asked. So I do want to tell you guys, you can move that mic up and down, make sure it's right there. And it's a little hard for us to hear up here sometimes, so make sure you're speaking very loud, very clearly. But with that, uh, give us your name and what your question for Carl is. Okay, you can hear me good, right? Not too loud? Okay, my name's Hunter. Um, first of all, I want to mention Carl Letters. This new look you have, the gray beard, it looks hella small. <laughs> I really like it. <laughs> There's nothing new about this look. It's been there for about four years. Where have you been? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, man. There was a compliment in there somewhere. I know. Second of all, I just want to mention, it's incredible the amount of charisma and enthusiasm you have. Like, you seem like such a happy guy. It's so inspiring. I know! I know! What's up with that, right? Yeah. Why aren't you mean and angry? Right? Why aren't you unhappy? Yeah. You know what? That's a great question. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. You know why that's a great question, man? Because I didn't anticipate it, number one. <laughs> number two, nobody's ever asked me that, or I've never heard anybody ask anybody else that. <laughs> so, the answer to it is, why not? Attention visitors, we would like to remind you of the following show floor health and safety rules. See, that's why I'm happy. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm happy, man. Be right here, right now. Okay, come on. Give up what happened yesterday. Give up what happened five years ago. Give up what happened ten years ago. Give up when you got your butt spanked when you were a kid. Give up that somebody didn't like you. Give it up, because it doesn't matter. Wow. Right here, right now, man. Right here, right now. You know? Don't invite it in your life by expecting it to be bad. You know? I, I, if anybody follows me on Twitter, there's one thing I close with on every time I do that. And that's the only social media I do, okay? And it's hashtag B, capital B, E, 
capital P, E-A-C-E, be peace. So, if you want peace, don't expect somebody else to bring it. Be the thing you want. If you want happiness, be happiness. Embody it, man. That's it. That's why. So get out of here, you know. <laughs> Thank you for the question. All right, what's your name? What's your question? My name is Mike, and uh, your story about leaving Oakland and going up to uh, With uh, Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver. I uh, I just wanted to say I know what that was, and I can honor be honored that I can say once a Raider, always a Raider. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's no question. My question for you is on the, on the set oh, of Predator with two future governors. What's the most humorous thing? <laughs> You know what? Here's the most humorous thing, that either one of them actually was a double. Okay? Because I'm telling you, man, when I write the book, there was not a governor on that set, okay? There wasn't. No, you know, I, I, look, who would have thunk it? Okay? Bunch of boneheads running around out in the jungles in, in, in Mexico, all of us. We're going to get two governors out of that group? America, how screwed up are you? <laughs> how messed up are you, folks, that you got from Predator, you get two governors in two of the greatest states in the nation. <laughs> uh, duh. I don't know, man. I don't know. It's, it's beyond me, That's but guess what? I'm going to leave That's it alone. Question. You're not going to get a third governor. <laughs> <laughs> I promise that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank question. you, Mike. Thank you much. What's your name? What's your question? Carl, my name's John. Uh, can you tell can you tell us what some of your favorite memories from filming Predator are? Some favorite memories from Predator? Uh, my favorite memories. My favorite memories. Tequila. <laughs> uh, really great Mexican food. Of all places, who'd have thunk you could get Mexican food in Mexico? Who knew? I mean, it was amazing. Uh, the beach. Because we were in a hotel right there. Literally, I had never lived at the beach until long after that movie. And I fell in love with listening to the ocean lap up against the shore at night because my bed, my room overlooked. And all you'd hear all night long as I'm trying to fall asleep is this water. And it, at first it just irritated the hell out of me because you just hear it, it's no quiet, right? But after a while it became so lovely to hear this you know, water washing up on the shore. Now, guess what? I don't live far from the beach. Yep. Love to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. <laughs> no, thank you. I don't want to play Apollo Creed. But they really want you on the show. Okay. How about this? How about if I play the cheapest guy in the world? Okay? And here's why. I had a buddy at the time who would call me so many times, as guys do, they're friends, and let's go have lunch. I swear this is a true story. He called me that day. I didn't go to lunch with him, but here's why. Because almost every time he called me, somehow we'd have lunch and then he wouldn't have enough cash. Or he wouldn't, would have forgotten his wallet. Or whatever the story was. I don't mind picking up a check. I do it, because why not? But it seemed like a habit that was really taking advantage of his friend, right? But I found it funny that it happened over and over. So there's a, there's a version of Carl Weathers that nobody's seen. The guy who wants to be on your tab, who will pull out a chicken bone and say, let's get a stew going, you know? Who talks about going to craft service and getting some veggies and a couple packets of uh, ramen and whatever, go home, throw it in a pot and get a stew going. They loved the idea, hence, there he was, the cheapest guy in the planet. <laughs> Thanks great for the question. question. Great question. What's your name, what's your question? Hello. Oh, there you go. Teacher voice. Uh, my name is Greg Garcia. I teach here at Portland, and I grew up on both the Rocky movies and uh, Predator. Cool. What do you teach? Uh, history. Oh, my nice. God, man, you're scaring me. <laughs> okay, that means I'd have to study if I was in your class. <laughs> All good. Um, my question is, you worked out with Stallone in 3, and according to the making of featurettes, everybody worked out on Predator together, so do you have a crazy workout story for either Stallone or Schwarzenegger? 
No, because they didn't work out. <laughs> they, just they lied. Away, yeah. no, they just lied. <laughs> they didn't work out. Uh, no, not really. I mean, you know, at, at that time, oh my God, when, when we did Rocky, the first Rocky, I was in my 20s. Any man here knows that 20 years old, you think you can do anything and do it forever. So you just go crazy, right? As you get older and your body starts to betray you, you say, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I'm hurting right now because of that, you know, all those years ago. But no, my, my, for me, back in the day, when I first went to Los Angeles, really pursue my career, which started basically in San Francisco, right? Doing commercials and all kinds of stuff. And um, I decided I was going to go to Hollywood and give myself a year to make it. Duh, that ain't smart, because there are people who go there forever and don't make it, right? But that's naivete. At any rate, once I got there, though, one of the things that a lot of actors would do was go to a gym and work out. And I found myself going to this gym, and I just became addicted. I worked out harder and more when I went to Los Angeles as an actor than I ever did any year I played pro football. <laughs> you know? I mean, man. And I would, in God's truth here, I would go on a fast, which basically consisted of juices and water and maybe some vegetable broth, but no solids, for anywhere between seven, 10, 12 days. And I would work out. Now I did other stupid things by drinking diet soda like there was no tomorrow, which is horrible for you. Uh, but, it's, you know, you get these cravings, so that sweetness became, so I'd do, man, eight or ten of those a day, right? But I'd work out literally at times three times a day, go to the gym and do that. So it just became this thing where I was driven. And so when you get into a movie where, let's face it, you're going to be running around naked a lot of the times and boxing shorts and no shirt and all that, I'm too vain, man. People are going to be looking. I got to be in the best shape of anybody that they're ever going to see, right? And then in Predator, I'm going to be standing there next to Arnold. Uh-uh, baby. I ain't going to look like second best, okay? Hence, train, 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 train. And so once we got in there, everybody got on the bandwagon and started training and running and doing all that stuff. It became just sort of a competition, really, you know? You get a bunch of boneheads together on a set. Guys of a certain age, and what is it? Everybody's going to outdo the next guy. That's how we all wound up, you know, not only becoming probably in better shape, but really being able to relate to each other as well. Long way to answer, but there it is. There you go. Thanks for the question. All right, I think we've got time for only one more question. Oh, sorry, folks. So, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. Folks. I went uh, too long. Also, no pressure on you now, so uh, <laughs> This better be the best question ever. Yes, what's your name? We can try and go to the next person. Yes. Sure, hope so. Fingers crossed. Uh, well, first, I just want to say thanks for coming to Portland. And my question is, I just want to ask about your directing experience with The Mandalorian and what it was like to shoot on the volume as opposed to uh, on a physical set. Okay, we, we, we got a question there, huh? That's a, pretty That's good a one. question, That's man. Pretty good one, yeah. Well, you certainly lined up at the right time, didn't you? <laughs> you the last one in there. Okay, so uh, there's a couple things that you need some information on. Uh, first question is, how many people in here know what the volume is? Well, there's a few, a few more than I step out there really. So, for those people who don't know, the volume basically is an area, a stage, which is what we dedicate to it, where you basically have 360, you can have, you know, uh, uh, images that look like the thing you're going to see ultimately on screen, on television. Uh, where it's all computerized and digitally um, not projected really, but on these screens that give you depth and a sense of, and actually it's more than 360 around, you even have a sky if you want. And in that space, which is where we shoot a lot of what you ultimately see, basically the world can go on forever. It's just this magical kind of technology that exists now. So when back in the day when we used to just have green screen or blue screen, 
where an actor on Predator is an example, uh, we're in the jungle, so there is no volume. Um, but, you know, if that's the monster, then they take a laser and point it up there and say, that's the monster, and he's going from there to there. So you look and follow the laser beam. Or they would just say, okay, that will branch up there, that's him. Now you go, oh, he's coming down to get you, or you're shooting at it, or whatever. Well, in the volume, it's there. You don't have to imagine it, right? And they can build set pieces in there to give you a sense of even greater depth, because there's something practical, a boulder or a tree or whatever, they build that and then you still see this projection in the background. So that's your introduction to what the volume actually is when you hear that word. Now, the beautiful thing about directing in that is that you don't have to get a bunch of actors to try to use their imaginations. They can see all the stuff that you are ultimately, what you, the audience, are gonna see on, on, on your screen at home or in the movie theater. It is so much easier in that respect. But, not unlike any other craft or art, it's incumbent upon you to really know, as a director, not only what you want to get out of something, what the writer is trying to accomplish, but how to manage conveying that to your actors, to set the camera where you and the DP decide it's gonna be best, uh, to block it and get the actors moving in the way you want them to move it, to decide whether you wanna use camera handheld, a steady cam, put it on sticks, uh, how many cameras you're gonna utilize for the same shot from different angles, whether you want to dolly something, all that stuff is up to the director to make decisions about. By and large, it's the same process, but the volume just gives you that added advantage of being able to see it all, right? Before uh, you get into post-production and then it's all sort of rendered. Uh, so if that kind of explains to you, and you know, I know your imagination can only take you so far if you haven't done it, but it's, it's a great tool the value is, and the technology, once it gets less and less expensive, is probably going to be utilized for far more than it's being utilized in now. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right, everyone, unfortunately, that's so all we have. One more time for Carl Lilly!